How wonderful was that song, everybody? Come on, let me just give that. Just, just, I love that song because there's, there's some powerful words, some great words of devotion for us, and it just shows how amazing our God is, how amazing his creation is. But there is a, there's a section of the song that I do want to bring up that I love. I think it's powerful. And it says this. It says, I, can, I won't sing it, I promise. <laughs> but it says, I can see your heart eight billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. We all just sang that, and it's, it's powerful. But see, I want to bring something up in that song. Do you know what this section means in this song? Do you know what the lyricist meant by, I can see your heart eight billion different ways? Do you guys know what the eight billion is? It's actually the world's population. So what the writer is saying is you can see, he can see God's love eight billion different ways. When you look around and see the eight billion people in the world, you can see who God loves. In fact, have any of you ever been onto the website where it actually shows a live tracker of the world population? I want to show it to you up here. You're welcome. <laughs> 8.1 billion people. And it's just ticking up. Now, when you see that number, what I love about it is there's 8.1 different stories happening right now. 8.1 different events. 8.1 different tears of sorrow, tears of joy, pain, suffering, loss, gain. 8.1 different stories. And if you look, one of those stories are yours in this room. So you make up that 8.1 billion stories. Everything that you have gone through in your life, everything that has led you to this moment right now in your life. You represent one of those numbers. And the song says, every precious one, a child you died to save. You're one of those. Your story, your testimony is part of the eight billion that Jesus gave his life for. And the song, as the song says, if he gave his life to love them, so will I. So my question for you is, Will you? Will you give your life to the 8 point billion people that are on this earth? But you see, that's a lot. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of pressure. I'm not going to put that pressure on you. Now, I'm going to narrow it down for you. Would you give your life to the few hundred that are in this room? But again, that's a lot of people. If you look, if you stand up and look around you, that is a lot of people. Again, I don't want to give you that pressure. So let me narrow it down one more time. Would you give your life to about 10 to 14 people that are in this room? Would you give your life to love them? You see, I'm not talking about dying on a cross. No, Jesus already did that. Nothing compares to how wide, how long, how high, and how deep Jesus' love is for us. What I am talking about today is are you willing to share your life, give pieces of your life to about 10 to 14 people in this room? See, at Calvary, there's core values we have at this church, and every week that you come here, you can see the core values. These are the purple banners up on the wall. And we have core values as everyone serves. We open the book. People matter. And the one I'm talking about this morning is the one on your right, which is authentic community, which is life groups, the life groups here at Calvary. And my question for you is, are you willing to share your life with the, the small groups, the life groups here at Calvary. And see, we call it authentic community because we truly want an authentic community. Now, we know when things are authentic and when things are not. When you go home from mama's cooking, you know that's authentic. You know that's good. You know that's delicious. And you know when you go to Taco Bell that you're not getting as authentic. I do love Taco Bell. Anybody with me? Love Taco Bell. I'll tell you my favorite, favorite order. I don't think they have it, um, but it is the double decker taco. There we go. <laughs> if you don't know what it is, I'm going to open your minds, your eyes. It is a soft shell tortilla with refried beans and a crunchy taco on top of that folded up. Now, is that authentic? 
No, but it's good. But we, <laughs> did I say yeah? But we know what, what being an authentic community is. And that's what we are, are thriving for here at Calvary is we want authentic relationships, real relationships, not fake. We don't want anybody to have to put on some sort of face, some mask, try and look the part. No, we want deep, real, authentic community. And we know what that looks like. And we know how that feels. Um, my wife and I, we just left Washington to come back here, back, back home to the Central Valley. But I had a, ha- had, have, we're still friends, have a best friend in Washington. And there was a moment when I realized, oh, this relationship is authentic. And it was, uh, my wife let me know that their dog died. And if any of you have lost a dog before, that's like losing a family member. That's, that's hard. Um, I lost a dog in, in college to, to cancer. And I'm telling you, I, I cried. <laughs> I wept so hard when that happened. And so my wife was like, hey, maybe you should text him and just see if you can come over and hang out. And I'm like, oh, he's probably just going to do what we all do and just say, oh, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. But my wife was like, no, you should, you should just reach out and see. So I text him. I'm like, hey, man, I heard about Chloe. Um, if you want, I can just, I can come over and uh, we can just sit out on your patio and not even say a word. Sent it thinking, all right, I can probably make other plans for that night. He immediately wrote back and said, I would love that, man. So you know, <laughs> I, I rushed over there to just sit in silence on that patio. And I'm telling you, church, he shared. He shared how he felt. He shared how this was hard for him. He cried. I cried um, because I knew that dog. And then he said something that was just so powerful to me. He said, you know, I feel like I have to be strong for my wife and for my son. And he goes, all I want is somebody to just come over and just give me a hug. And now, church, if you, one thing you need to know about me is I'm not a hugger. <laughs> not at all. I did not grow up in a family where we gave each other hugs. But you best believe the Holy Spirit convicted me. And I gave that man the biggest hug I've ever given to anybody in my life. That's authentic. That's real. That's a real relationship. And that's what we want in our church community. That's what we want in our life groups is for you to be yourself. For you to be real, to be unfiltered, maybe not too unfiltered, you know, have some discretion (laughs) and how unfiltered you need to be. But that's authentic community. So you see, when you see that 8.1 billion number, those are real stories. They're not fake. They're authentic. 8.1 billion stories that God's doing in this world. And our life groups here are filled with the 8.1 billion stories. But here's a truth, is they might be missing yours. They might be missing your story, what God has been doing in your life. And on the other side, maybe you don't even realize what God has been doing in your stories. Maybe you need a life group to help point you and show you what God is doing. So this morning, here's my hope for you, is for you to bring your story to life. Bring your story to life. Let it come to life. Let it come to life groups. Let it bring new life to maybe somebody who can hear it and needs to hear your story. See, everything that God has brought you through could be to help somebody who might be currently going through it, but you need to express it. And I've, I've talked with people before, and for some reason, we just feel like we wanna keep it in. And I don't know the reason, maybe we don't feel like people care, Maybe we don't feel like, uh, we feel like maybe it's more of a burden for somebody to carry it. But see, our authentic life groups is, no, we, we want it. We want your mess. We want what God has put you through. So we can form the authentic community here at Calvary. So we want you to bring your story to life. So we all have gone through things, some good, some bad, but we all need each other. Because here's the truth. We should never have to feel alone when there's 8.1 billion people on this earth. Let's shrink that down. We should never feel alone when there's a couple hundred people in this room. And we should never feel alone 
when there's about 10 to 14 people who are ready to show you the love of Christ. So our stories, they have to be brought to life. They have to be brought to life groups. And so what I'm gonna talk about this morning is what we are hoping for to happen to create the authentic life group. And the first thing that we do for our life groups is we share. We share what happens. We share our lives. We share what is going on in our life, what has happened so far. We share all the hurt, all the pain, all the joys. See, I have this, uh, this word picture I want to show you guys. This fabric right here represents your life. Now, it's a scrappy little piece of fabric. And maybe at this point of your life, that's how you feel, a little scrappy. The things that you have put through, maybe you felt like you have been put through the ringer. Now, you see, this fabric has pieces coming apart, and maybe that's how you feel right now this morning is, I feel like I'm coming apart. Like right here, maybe this is a, a relationship that has ended in your life, whether that's a divorce or just a pet, something in your life that has ended. Maybe this one right here represents new, a new job, a new opportunity, new life. This one could represent maybe an addiction that you're fighting. But as you see, as life happens, more and more pieces are just getting pulled and becoming more and more scrappy and feeling worn, feeling tired, feeling pulled at all ends. Maybe that's how you feel right now. And you're kind of keeping it to yourself. You're keeping it to yourself. So you, right here, this might be your little piece of scrappy fabric right now. And I want to tell you, if anyone knows how you feel, how life has felt, if that's you, if you have gone through so much in your life, the person who I believe understands where you're coming from is Paul. So this morning, we're going to look at what Paul says about everything that he's gone through in the book of Colossians. So in your Bibles, could you go to Colossians chapter 1? Now, Paul, um, at the he went by the name of Saul, so that you guys know, so I might jump back and forth to that name. He shared about his struggle. He shared what he went through. He shared what happened, and he also tells us how he felt about what he went through. So here's what Paul says. Colossians 1.24, he says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. So I want to give you some context of Paul. See, Paul, he knew pain and suffering. It was very common in his ministry. In fact, pain and suffering was a guarantee in Paul's life. It was a promise by Jesus. So this is what happened in his life. He went by the name Saul, and Saul was on the way to persecute Christians. That was, that, he got permission. He was excited to do it. He was going to persecute Christians. But then Jesus interrupted his life, intercepted his life with a flash of light, blinded Saul and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So he blinded Saul so he could actually see what was going on. And so after this interception, this transformation in Saul's life, this, this redirection or detour in his life, Jesus speaking about him says, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. That is, that is the promise. That is the guarantee that Saul has received on his life. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And it came to be because suffer was a continual feature in the ministry of Paul. But he was okay with it. But let me tell you what happened with Paul. Paul was arrested many times. Paul was beaten many times. There's even a moment where he was beaten and stoned to death, where the leaders looked at him and declared him dead. Like he was so badly beaten that he was declared dead. And they walked away from him. Saul, Paul eventually got up and went right back into that city. And again, he was run out of cities. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. And he even, this is probably, speaking for him, probably one of the hardest things. He had people leave him and leave the faith. People that he trusted, people that he poured into, abandoned in him and left the faith in Christ. That had to hurt as well. So he understood physical pain. He understood the emotional 
pain as well. And what Paul says, and as, as he was talking about it, he says he rejoices about it. But Paul understood the pain and suffering, and he, he shared it. And this happens in our life groups each and every week. So we share. In our life groups, we want to share what has happened in our life, what is happening in our lives. Maybe also what we hope to happen in our lives. Because when we look at this piece of fabric, there's a lot going on. And maybe you feel like that. There is a lot going on right now, and there's a lot that you're carrying. There's a lot that you just feel like, I am getting worn out. But here's what I want to tell you, is your story is important. And right now, maybe you don't feel that way, but I want you to know your story is important. Everything that you have gone through is important. Your pain, your suffering, your joys, it is important. And if you're wondering why, it is because it is the story of how God is moving in your life and those around you. Your story is a part of what God is doing in this world. When you look at the 8.1 billion people in this world, it is a story of what God is doing with our world. You see, what I like to tell people is when, the, when our Bible was finished, God didn't stop moving. God did not stop working. He is still working through your life. But if you are not sharing it, if you are keeping it inside, then there is a piece of God's story missing in this world. There's a piece of God's story missing at Calvary. There's a piece of God's story missing in our life groups. So your story is important. I want you to hear that. I want you to feel that. Because like I said, we should never feel alone or feel like nobody cares when there's 8.1 billion people around us. So share your story. Share the hard times. Share the, the good times. You know, we just went through a whole uh, summer series in the book of Judges where we got to see what God was doing through his people. We got to see God listen to prayer. We got to see God help his people. We got to see God care and get heartbroken by when his people would sin. That's still the case today, church. As when you share your story, we get to see God care. We get to see God answer prayers. We get to see God moving. And maybe right now you don't see it in your life, but the life group can help you see and put the, pic the pieces together, paint the picture for you so you can see that God is still moving, that God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you are still loved and cared for. You are part of the precious one, a child he died to save. Amen. That is your story. So we share we share like Paul shared his. And why Paul was okay, he says, I rejoice. I rejoice in my suffering. I rejoice for your sake. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh. I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Church, Paul rejoiced because God's word was becoming fully known in his life. Everything that he has gone through is for the sake of the word. Everything that you have gone through can be to let the world know who God is, that he is the truth, that he is the way, that he is alive. Paul is making what was unknown known. So this is why he rejoices. See, to Paul, what he has gone through and will continue to go through had a purpose for the kingdom of heaven, the purpose so people can know his Savior, and the same could be saved for your life, that your story can make the word of God fully known, but we have to share what is going on. Let's not hide it. Let's not keep it in. Your story is not a burden. Your story is not a burden. Your story is important, important for the picture, important for the kingdom. I want you to hear that, but most importantly, I want you to feel that. Feel that everything that you have gone through, it matters. It matters, <laughs> this is why we share. And it's why we do the next thing, because as your life can make the word of God known, what we are doing in our life group to make that happen even more is we study. We study God's word. Because we don't only want to share our story, we want to share his. We want to share his story. 
See, our goal is to learn how to live out Christianity in our everyday life. Our everyday life. Study the word to make sense of the pieces of fabric that are pulling from our life. We want to make sense of this, of what is happening. Listen to what Paul says when it comes to this. He says, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may, represent, or we may present everyone mature in Christ. So what we see here is Paul, he, he, he presents the word of God in three ways. It says he proclaims, he warns, and he teaches. The first thing he does is he proclaims the name of the Lord. He is telling everyone about Jesus, this amazing person that has changed his life, that has transformed his life, that has intercepted his life. This is an amazing person that who loves him more than anyone could ever love him. Love him so much that he helped him not make, to not do damage to other people and to himself. See, Jesus stopped him right in his track from going the wrong direction. So he's proclaiming the name of the Lord, how his life has been changed. So he is telling anyone with ears, and we see when we read scripture, this is very common for anybody who encountered Jesus. Now we see in the book, him heal a man who was deaf. Healed a man, and this man was grateful. You see it, he was so grateful for this healing that he received. But Jesus told him, he said, hey, don't, don't tell anybody about me. Just accept, just accept your healing. But he could not do that. It said he was zealously proclaiming the name of Jesus because of that healing, because of that encounter. But you see, here's the amazing part about encountering Jesus. There were so many people who didn't actually even receive a physical healing from him. They just had a conversation with him and wanted to proclaim his name. We see that with Zacchaeus, who just had a meal with Jesus. And he wanted to give back, not want to give back more than what he took from his people. And we see that with the woman at the well in John 4, the Samaritan woman at the well, who spent a good amount of time having a conversation with Jesus. In fact, if you read it, she gets in a theological, to, theological debate with Jesus. It's actually a funny encounter. But in that encounter, as she's getting to know more and more about her Messiah, the disciples show up and it like kind of scared her because in this time, not, she kind of feels like an outcast and now there's 12 men coming her direction. That would be a little terrifying for a person right now. And so she runs away. But here's the truth. She didn't run away to hide. She ran away to proclaim the name of Jesus. She, she wanted to run away so everybody else in her village can encounter this person who in that short amount of time has changed her life. Here's what it says. It says, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Her testimony was saying, he told me all that I have ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And then they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believed. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Church, that is proclaiming the name of the Lord. Because of this woman's experience, because of everything that this woman has gone through, because she said, he's told me all that I have done. Because of all that she has done and how Jesus has intercepted it, other people were getting to know his word. We're studying his word. Imagine how many people that you know could have this same encounter this same experience through what you have felt and experienced. What your testimony could do in getting this word of God known. So Paul proclaims it. The people in the New Testament, they are proclaiming his name. And the next thing that Paul does, it says he warns and teaches everyone now that just makes sense, especially at this time, because as Paul is so excited about his Savior, he's proclaiming the name of Jesus. The Samaritan woman is proclaiming the name of Jesus. Zacchaeus is proclaiming the name of Jesus. The next logical question would be, well, who is Jesus? And Scripture tells us that we should be ready to give an account for what we believe in. And so Paul says he warns and he teaches he teaches people about Jesus. He teaches in scripture of Jesus. You know, when Jesus was resurrected, 
he encountered two men on the road uh, to Emmaus, I believe the name. And it says that when he was revealing himself, that he was teaching them from the Old Testament how scripture points to Jesus, how scripture points to himself. That's what Paul is doing with every church, every person he encounters is showing how you can see Jesus through the old and through creation. When we sing the so will I and see the the billions of galaxies, everything points to Jesus. So when our life groups meet, we are trying to point to Jesus. We study his word. We don't only share our story. We share his. So we get into the word to read the stories of our Messiah, to teach the stories of our Messiah. We do what it says on that banner, one of our values. We open the book so we can get all the wisdom that we can to be mature in Christ. We let the word of God guide our paths to make sense of our world, to make sense of our pieces of fabric, to help us become better versions, to be transformed like Paul was transformed. We let and study this God breathed, this Holy Spirit inspired word so it can bring, breathe life into us. And we want it to give us strength and we want it to give us support so we can do that for others, which is the next thing that we do in our life groups is we support. We support. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, is what Paul says as we continue this letter. And for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. What Paul is writing here is he wants the church in Laodicea and the ones and the one he's writing here to the Colossians to be encouraged, to be knit together in love so they can reach the full assurance. This is a beautiful image. I love this image, being knit together. See, Paul's hope is that everyone is being united in love. United in love. He actually says this this, uh, thought again in chapter three. He says, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. We read knitted, we read united, we read binding. This is bringing them all together to support each other, to be there for each other. To have a community brought together by love of Christ to show that love to each other. Because the truth is, church, that's how the love of Christ can be known in this world. See, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he was trusting the 12 to spread this love, to spread his love, to be example of his love. That is still what we are to, to do today is if we want people to know the love of Christ, we must first demonstrate and show them the love of Christ. If we are doing that, then this world gets his love. If we do that, then 8.1 billion people will feel his love, but it starts with us. So Paul, he is telling this church, I want you guys to be knit together, to be bonded together in this love, this love that transcends everything. And Jesus is trusting them and he's trusting us. In John 15, Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Now, I want to share with you guys a life group story that happened with my wife and I about a year and a half ago. It's when we got to meet our daughter, Riley. Now, this was a scheduled C-section, which, if I'm being honest with you, is a kind of a weird concept. It's like being, it's like being checked into a hotel and you, you getting a kid right afterwards. So that's what we were doing. We were on our way to this scheduled C-section. We were really excited. We were going to meet our daughter, Riley. But on, uh, on our way, uh, because it's not an emergency, we stopped to get ourselves some Starbucks because we were going to be there for three days. We didn't know how much we were going to get Starbucks. So we're in the drive through and I do my typical order, which is a vanilla sweet cream cold brew with half pumps of vanilla. If any of you guys want to bless me, you guys got the notes, write that down, vanilla sweet cream cold brew, half pumps of vanilla. So as I'm ordering my drink, 
a phone call comes in. And I can immediately tell by my wife's demeanor, this was not a good phone call. So I'm trying to get, get answers from her, and it's not going well. So I pull over into the parking lot, and I'm like, okay, Audra, what happened? Tell me what happened. And she said, the nurse called. I'm like, okay, what did the nurse say? And she said that they are so backed up and they don't have enough staff that she would highly recommend and advise that we don't come. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what? And so I'm asking my wife, I'm like, so did she say don't come? She goes, no, she's like, she said like, she'd highly advise us not to come. So I'm confused. That makes no sense to me. I'm, uh, I'm a black and white kind of guy. Uh, so there's a whole lot of gray in that statement. And I was like, wait, what? And I'm like, this isn't just like a dentist appointment or like registering your car at the DMV. I'm like, this is a life. This is a, this is a child. <laughs> and guys, let you know, like when, when you have a scheduled C-section, you can, the, one of the benefits of it is you get to plan everything out. So we have like, our, we're not working right now. We're taking our, our time off. We have somebody watching our son. We have somebody watching our dog, somebody watching our house. We have everything lined up. And now this lady on the phone is telling us, hey, we recommend highly that you don't show up to the hospital. And to give you guys more context, this is like a 40-minute drive for us. So this is kind of a commitment. And I got coffee. <laughs> and so my wife is crying I'm trying not to cry. I'm confused. And I'm like, what do we do? What do we do? And she was like, if you guys show up, we might send you home. And so I'm like, Audra, call Krista. Now, here's what you guys need to know about Krista. Krista is in our life group. And Krista is the labor and delivery nurse at this hospital. And Krista helped us with our son the first time when it was an emergency C-section. So we call Krista because we truly have no idea protocol, what's going on. So we're like, Krista, what's going on? What do we do? And Krista reassured us. She was kind. She's very loving. And she said to us, hey, everything's going to be okay. Just show up. I know everything will be fine. And so we're like, okay. So we get to the hospital. And right there in the lobby is Krista with her scrubs on, waiting for us. So she came on her day off to support us, and we got to meet our daughter that day. Now here, see here's what's amazing, is the story of Life Group. She was in our Life Group, she helped support us. But you see, it wasn't just supporting us. She was excited for her life being changed because a new baby was coming. So Krista was more than happy to be there so she could also meet my daughter. In fact, because she was a nurse, she met my daughter before I got to meet my daughter. <laughs> Church, that's life groups. That's authentic community right there. Krista came to us, came to help us, came to support us when we truly could not do anything. We felt helpless. We felt like we couldn't do anything. And I'll be honest with you, church, I have no idea what we would have done if we didn't have Krista. But here's what's amazing. I don't have to know. I don't have to know. Because God gave us this amazing relationship, this authentic relationship in our life groups. So I want to keep painting this picture for you guys about this fabric, because this is truly what's happening in our life group. Again, this is you. This is representing everything that you have gone through, your pains, your confusions, your struggles, your joys, things that you're looking forward to. This is you. But see, you're not alone here at Calvary, because there's other people that are next to you in this room, going through pains, going through struggles, going through joys. And there's so many of you who might be feeling alone. But you see, at Calvary, with our life groups, we're hoping that you guys are coming together and you're growing. And as you come together, you'll start noticing that you're being knitted or quilted in love. That you're being together. Now, what you'll notice is you still have some of these scrappy pieces, but you also notice that people are supporting the other ones. So there's not so many. But you see, as life groups are growing and more people are feeling the love, more people are coming together. 
More people are being knitted together in this love. But here's the truth, and I'm being honest with you. You can find this anywhere. You can find this at country clubs. You can find this with the, your kids' uh, sports teams and the families that are all suffering together with all the practices. You can find this. But what's different here at Calvary is that you're also being supported with Christ. That's where the study comes in. That's where we are now having his support, his strength, him bonding us together, being united, being knitted or quilted together in his love. But you see, it doesn't end there. Because as that's happening, over time, we will start having this community of just authentic people coming together in his love, quilted. Church, this is life groups at Calvary. This is what's happening each and every day. And our life groups might be missing you. And truthfully, you might be missing the support, the love, being knitted together. This right here demonstrates our next thing that we do in our life groups, which is we serve. Now what you need to know is this quilt was quilted by our quilting life group that we have here at Calvary. Yes, I talked to uh, Rennell who uh, leads that life group and she gave me this analogy, I want you to be honest with you. And I told her, I'm like, hey, tell me more about this life group. And she told me about the scrappy little pieces coming together. And what this team does is when there's a need of, like, of a veteran who needs a quilt, that team comes together and they quilt. They come together. We have so many life groups who are serving. And our hope is this, that as we are growing together and supporting each other and studying the word together, that now we will go out and serve the community. First Peter 4.10 says this, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. What I want you guys to know is all of us have been given gifts. Gifts of teaching, preaching, healing, shepherding, pastoring. What I want you guys to know is these gifts are actually not for us. We are supposed to be instruments like Paul to gift other people with what has been given to us. And this quilting team, have they have a wonderful gift. They are serving the community. And our hope is as we are life groups, are growing together, we will start serving the 8.1 billion people in this world. So church, if you're not in a life group, find one. Be in one here. We will have one for you. So you no longer need to feel alone when there's 8.1 billion people in this world or the few hundred in this room. So bring your story to life. Let's bring your story to life.